Before we go over the famous hex murder case, we'd like to let you know about two upcoming events we think you'll enjoy. On November 28th, York County Libraries and the York County History Center will hold Bookmarked, a quarterly Zoom book discussion. Historian Joseph David Kress will discuss his book, Murder and Mayhem in York County, which covers a dozen local history true crime cases. The Hex Murder is among them. Books are available for checkout at York County Libraries or for sale in the History Center bookshop. Links are in the description and we hope to see you November 28th. If you don't feel like you have time to read a whole book right now, come to the podcast discussion group Wine and Crime After Dark held at 6 p.m. on the second Friday of each month at Paul Smith Library in Shrewsbury. Listen to the True Crime Podcast of the Month, bring your own snacks and drinks, and come discuss each month's case with other armchair detectives. Check out our online events calendar for the next meetup. Link is in the description. Trigger warning. This historical true crime case touches on mental health issues, physical assault, and murder. In 1928, farmer Nelson Raymeyer was murdered in his home in Stewartstown, Pennsylvania, just before Thanksgiving. Why? The state said the motive was robbery. The three defendants insisted it wasn't. The reason they gave? Witchcraft. Many York County locals grew up hearing some version of the tale of the Hex Hollow murder. But what's the real story? A term you might have heard connected to this case is powwowing. While the word comes from Algonquin, in this case it refers to someone who practiced Pennsylvania Dutch folk medicine and faith healing. You could ask a powwower to cure your illness, provide good luck to your animals or crops, or ensure safe travels. You could also ask them to curse or hex someone. In the 1920s, some locals deeply believed in the abilities of powwowers. Others figured it can't hurt to try and some threw the whole lot out as superstitious nonsense. Consider the everyday folk beliefs that persist. Don't break a mirror because it's bad luck. Find a four-leaf clover? Grab it. The Red Sox's 86-year losing streak was clearly because of the curse of the Bambino. People today are not very different to the York Countians of 1928. For those who did believe in powwowing, there were a few things that everybody knew. Powwowing tended to run in families. Most powwowers had a book of prayers, spells, and recipes they used. And everyone knew that if you were hexed, nothing would go right until it was lifted. In 1928, Nelson Raymeyer was 60 years old. His little farm in Raymeyer's Hollow was enough for him to grow crops and care for a few farm animals. He was well known in the area as a powwow practitioner, and locals often visited him for help. The book he used was called The Long Lost Friend by George Holman. It was a very common powwow book in the area. In fact, many families used it, or books like it, as a sort of first aid home remedy manual. Raymeyer was married, but in the early 1920s, his wife, Alice, moved herself and their children to a separate home about a mile away. While by all accounts, she still was fond of Nelson, She said that Nelson's powwowing caused too many daily disruptions. Despite their separation, she still brought their children to him for powwowing, so the family seemed to remain on friendly terms. To others in the area, Raymeyer was seen as isolated. One person described him as, quote, a little strange, but he seemed well regarded overall. His death was a shock to his community. There were three people who took part in killing Nelson Raymeyer in 1928. John Blymeyer, John Curry, and Wilbert Hess. John Blymeyer, the ringleader of the group, also came from a family of powwow practitioners. His ancestors were said to have great power, but John just didn't seem to have the same abilities, although he kept trying. Nothing else he did in life ever seemed to work out well, either. He dropped out of school at 13 and started working in a cigar factory, but it wasn't a steady career. He'd skip his job to go work on his powwowing. He didn't get fired because when he did show up, he was manic and three times as productive as other workers, but not showing up to work left his income uncertain. His tough times continued. One of his sisters died. Two of his own children died in infancy 
he himself became ill. Due to his background, all of this convinced him that someone had cursed him, or in local terms, he was hexed. He started spending money visiting different powwows, traveling hundreds of miles to see them. They all agreed he was hexed, but weren't able to help. Every setback drove John Blymeyer deeper into his belief. His wife's parents, deeply concerned for their daughter's safety, had him committed to the state hospital for mental health, and there he was diagnosed with having psychosis and, quote, witchcraft delusions. But after a few months, he walked out untreated. The underfunded hospital didn't have the resources to bring him back. Blymeyer returned to his pattern of occasionally showing up to work and seeking someone to lift the curse. But shortly after he arrived back home, his wife divorced him. To Blymeyer, it was just more proof of the hex. Even those who loved him and believed in powwowing thought his conviction was extreme. At his trial, his own father testified that, quote, John was sick and couldn't work, and there was something the matter with his head. In 1928, John was in his early 30s and had been suffering for years. Someone suggested that he visit another powwow practitioner, Emma Knopp, known as the Marietta Witch. She had him return again and again, dribbling out bits of information. After the fifth visit, at which point Blymeyer had paid her more than $25 in total, she revealed to Blymeyer that the person who hexed him was none other than Nelson Raymeyer, a powwower that John Blymeyer had known since his childhood. John protested that it surely couldn't be Nelson. He was a good man. But Blymeyer was desperate. What, he asked her, did he have to do to lift the hex? Emma Knopp prescribed a well-known remedy. Get Raymeyer's powwow book and burn it. Cut a lock of his hair and bury it eight feet deep, and your curse will be lifted, she promised. Finally, a solution. But Blymeyer knew he would need help. John Curry, aged 14 in 1928, came from a troubled home. His father had died when he was very young, and his stepfather was a violent alcoholic. Living with his mother and stepfather was so bad that at age 13, he left home. He ended up getting a job at the same cigar factory as John Blymeyer. Soon after they met, John Curry took very ill, and Blymeyer suggested that he could try to powwow him well again. It evidently worked for once. The young teen credited Blymeyer with saving his life. From then on, Curry said he believed everything Blymeyer told him, especially about hexes. Maybe he, John Curry, was hexed too. At the time, Curry was acquainted with another local family, the Hesses. Things had been going well for the Hess family until 1926, but that year started a string of misfortunes that didn't seem to stop. Their crops were bad, their chickens weren't laying, and several were stolen. The cows were not producing as much milk, and later some of the herd died. But worst of all were several sudden deaths within the Hess family. Who did they consult about this string of bad luck? John Curry's friend, who powwowed him well. Surely they could trust that man. John Blymeyer suggested that the Hess family cousins had hired someone to bewitch them. And who was the top of Blymeyer's list? Nelson Raymeyer, of course. By Sunday, November 25th, 1928, Blymeyer had persuaded John Curry and the Hess family that Raymeyer was to blame for all of their troubles. He told them Emma Knopp's advice, and they agreed to help get Raymeyer's hair and book. Then, surely, all of their troubles would stop. On Monday, November 26th, Blymeyer and Curry got a ride from one of the Hesses to Stewartstown. They actually stopped and asked Mrs. Alice Raymeyer for directions. She gave them. Obviously, they weren't the first people asking how to get to the powwower's house. They arrived at Raymeyer's house, and he welcomed them in to stay the night. Blymeyer and Raymeyer sat up most of the night, talking about powwowing. Blymeyer and Curry quickly decided that Raymeyer was too strong for them to take on alone. They'd need another man to help. But now they knew where his house was, and that it was isolated with no close neighbors. 
The morning of Tuesday the 27th, they returned to the Hess family home, and Blymeyer said they'd need a third man to help lift the curse. Wilbur Hess, a strong 18-year-old, was suggested. Late that evening, the trio caught another ride to Stewartstown. They brought with them 25 feet of rope. They arrived so late that Nelson Raymeyer was asleep. He shouted down, asking who was there, and Blymeyer told him he'd left a book there the night prior. Raymeyer led them in to look for it, and as a courteous host, bent down to light a fire. With Raymeyer's back turned to them, Blymeyer gestured for Hess to hold him down. Raymeyer was taken by surprise. As soon as he was down, John Curry jumped on the man as well. Raymeyer fought. Blymeyer tried to tie him down, but couldn't. So he picked up a piece of wood and brought it down on Raymeyer's head. It didn't take long for the others to join in, and they kept going until he stopped fighting them. During his trial, Hess testified that Blymeyer told him, Give us your book. Raymeyer assumed they were looking for money, so he gave them his pocketbook, not his copy of The Long Lost Friend. They took the pocketbook, but still tied him up. Wilbur Hess testified that he said several times to cut Raymeyer's hair, as was the plan. But Blymeyer said to put the rope around Raymeyer's neck. John Curry obeyed, and Blymeyer tied it. Then he told Curry to pull. Afterward, the three looked for anything worth taking. They found a few dollars in a dresser upstairs. There was no point in looking for the book or cutting the hair now. Everyone knew the other way to lift a hex was to kill the person who said it. Finally, they thought to cover their tracks. They decided fire would do it. The perpetrators pulled several flammable items over Nelson Raymire's body, poured out a lamp, lit it on fire and fled, closing the doors behind them. They walked the long, long way back to the Hess farmhouse in the early hours of Wednesday the 28th. Later that morning, Wilbur Hess told his family what happened in Raymire's Hollow. They quickly told him not to talk about it. But John Blymire came back late on Wednesday, asking for a ride back to Stewartstown. Blymire told them that he'd burnt the clothes he'd worn the previous night, but wanted to check that the rest of the evidence was gone. The family refused. The day after that was Thanksgiving of 1929. Raymire's house had not burned down, but his neighbors knew something was wrong. His animals were crying out because they hadn't been tended for over a full day. When the neighbors came to check, they could clearly see that Raymeyer had been murdered. Aside from a small hole in the floor and damage to Raymeyer's body, the fire hadn't done much, leaving the evidence clear. It didn't even take long to solve the case. Mrs. Alice Raymeyer well remembered the faces of the men who had last asked for directions to her husband's house. Less than two days later, the York Dispatch was reporting on the murder, the perpetrators, and their confessions. The trial started less than six weeks later. The court tried to keep its focus on the known facts of the case and tried to keep witchcraft and hexing out of the record, but it didn't work. The case quickly became internationally famous, with the press focusing on hexing and voodoo. York County was largely presented as being filled with uneducated, gullible country yokels steeped in medieval superstition. The overall outcomes? Blymeyer's trial took three days to conclude, Curry's trial took two, and Hess's trial took another two days. Blymeyer and Curry were both found guilty of murder in the first degree, and were sentenced to life in prison. Hess was convicted of murder in the second degree and was sentenced to 10 to 20 years. In 1939, after serving 10 years, Wilbur Hess went back home and lived a quiet life, dying in 1979. In 1934, Curry's life sentence was commuted to 20 years. He was granted a special dispensation to join the armed forces in 1939. He had learned to paint, and he helped draft the maps for the Normandy invasion, and designed the shoulder patches for Operation Overlord. He returned to York County in 1946 and was active in the local art community for the rest of his life. He died in 1963 of a heart attack.
John Blymeyer was convicted of first-degree murder and was also sentenced to life in prison. When interviewed shortly after his sentencing, he claimed to be relieved, truly believing that his curse had been lifted. He was held in the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia until 1953, when his sentence was commuted. He was granted parole and worked off and on until his death in 1972. The Raymeyer family did their best to live down the scandal and rumors, but stories about the murder quickly grew and spread far beyond the facts. Tall tales, stories, even a few movies were inspired by the crime. In the late 1990s, the York Bar Association even held a live reenactment of the historical trials. Ultimately, what should have been a story about one man's mental health struggles spiraling out of control and unfortunately ending with the murder of an innocent man ended up for decades becoming an embellished tale. We hope our video has provided some insight into the people involved in this case. There are far more details available than we were able to provide here. If you like digging into cases like this, Make sure to join us in November for Bookmarked or Wine and Crime After Dark. Links are below.